First Frisco is an engaging, friendly atmosphere geared toward ministering to your entire family. We feel called to build a family of faith that reaches out to the world with the good news that Jesus loves everyone. As followers of Jesus, we are working to be disciples of Jesus Christ who make disciples of Jesus Christ. We engage in ministry that challenge us to serve and share in our neighborhood and beyond. Life Song is our contemporary worship experience at 9.30 a.m. each Sunday morning. We strive to provide a spirit-filled worship experience and are led in music by the Life Song worship team. We are also rich in history and tradition with an excellent traditional worship experience at our 11 a.m. service with music led by our chancel choir. Our messages are practical and grounded in scripture. We are blessed to have many new families joining our church. We would love for you to join as we connect to the kingdom of God and learn to follow Jesus. If you are looking for a church community where there is a family feeling and a commitment to Christ, I hope you will visit us soon. If you do, you just might find your family of faith. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Now, isn't this a beautiful day out there today? If you don't think it's a beautiful day, you, you weren't looking. But it's a beautiful day. It's good to be here as we gather for worship this day. Uh, let me share with you some announcements this morning. Not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, and we start our Lenten journey uh, we will have come and go imposition of ashes at 7 a.m., noon, and 2.45 here in the sanctuary. And then we will have an Ash Wednesday service at 7 p.m. that day here in the sanctuary. The day before that, Shrove Tuesday, we have our pancake dinner that the youth put on for us. So that information is in your bulletin. Be sure and mark your calendars for that. On the 18th of February, which is two days from today, the United Methodist Women have a speaker and dinner event, and you can learn more about that in your bulletin and also at the table in the gathering area. And then our senior adult ministry, the Joy Group, has a luncheon on the 20th, uh, and you can find out more information about that either at the gathering area or in your bulletin. So as we worship today, let's find those red registration pads and pass those down that we may have record of all who are in attendance this day. Uh, let us stand and greet each other. Good morning, church. Would you join us in singing This Is The Day? <laughs> we will be singing this antiphonally. That's a big word, which means the choir goes first and then you repeat. <laughs>
This is the day that the Lord has made. Let's declare our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and I want to welcome you again. And as I welcome you, look, here they already come. Children, come on down. Pastor Cheryl has a message for you. try that again. I don't think they're awake. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, you guys almost have an idea of what I'm going to be talking about this morning. I am going to preach this morning and I'll ask first of all that you pray for me, but I'm going to use a word that you may not know what it means. The word is fervent. Does anybody know what fervent means? Well, I'll tell you. Fervent means to do something with excitement. It means to give it all you've got. It means to be real sincere when you do it. Now, let me show you an example. If I tell you that under this napkin is a bowl full of broccoli and cauliflower, would you be very excited about that? As long as it's not cooked. Okay, we got one yes. We got, uh, that's a maybe. But for the... Uh, no, he said, no, I don't think so. So for the most part, you wouldn't be too excited about that. But what if I lift up this napkin and show you a bowl full of candy? Yeah. That's fervent. That's being excited. So I'm going to lift this up. If I lift it up and there's broccoli and cauliflower there, I want you to say, I okay. Nothing. nothing. Well, if there's nothing, I want you to go, ew. <laughs> but if it's candy, I want to hear your most Enthusiastic, fervent, yay! Ready? Count to three. One, two, three. Yay! yay. <laughs> now that is fervent. That is giving it all you got. Now, I am going to share my candy with you. And it doesn't matter that you, how much you hollered or how strong your yay was, because I love you guys. And I want to share what I have with you. And we're going to be talking about that very thing. As I talk about Hannah this morning. God doesn't require that you do something strong or use big words when you pray, but he wants you to give all of his heart. He wants you to be excited when, he, when you come before him. Amen? Amen? Now, the word you're going to listen for, what's the word you're going to listen for in the sermon? Fervent. What is it? Fervent. All right, I want you to listen for it and tell me when you hear it, okay? I want you to tell me that you heard it after it. And then after church. See, Miss Trish, she'll be out at the Welcome Center with this bowl, and you can get a treat. Amen? Amen. Pray with me, please. Dear God, thank you for allowing us to be in your presence. Thank you for being a friend that I can talk to. In Jesus' name, amen. Trish, I mean, Trish, Cheryl, um, the Bible also says hope deferred makes the heart sick. And so I saw a few of the kids going when they heard that they had to wait till after the service to get their candy. But they were a little less fervent. Well, let's pray together. 
Oh, Holy Lord, thank you for your standing invitation, gathering us into worship. And so, Lord, gather us in right now. Gather us in, and Lord, help us to allow ourselves to be gathered in. Lord, help us to cast our cares on you because you care for us. And Lord, I pray that whatever circumstances are are around us right now, whatever circumstances are in our life, Lord, that we will be able to give our fears and our anxieties to you. And that right now, right now, we will receive your peace that passes all understanding. Lord, help us to receive that. Lord, help us to become people of prayer, people who pray fervently like Hannah, people who don't neglect the incredible gift of direct access to our Heavenly Father. But Lord, also help us to be like Hannah in that we don't just give you our concerns or give you, but Lord, that we really give you the desires of our heart. Lord, sometimes we're not even willing to admit the desires of of our heart to ourself because we're so afraid that maybe those won't be the desires of your heart. But Lord, help us to trust in your love. Perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear and makes room for peace. But Lord, as we also understand the words of Jesus, you are a good, good father who desires good gifts for your children. So Lord, as we come into relationship with you, as our heart begins to beat as one with your heart. Lord, give us the desires of our heart. You've given us those desires. So, Lord, give us the desires of our heart. And above all, help us to receive the love that casts out fear. You are the source of that love. Lord, we are not. So fill us up to overflowing. Fill us up to overflowing so that we can share. Lord, I pray that you'll be very near those who are struggling Uh, with the circumstances of their life, particularly illnesses and surgery recoveries and surgeries that are coming up. Lord, help us. Help us to trust in your love. Help us to remember that you're right there with us always, even when we're in the midst of circumstances that we would not choose for ourselves. Help us to know that you're with us. Hear us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Man, you may be seated in the presence of God. Is sermon time? Is oh, oh what? <laughs> Mark missed it this morning. Yeah, we gotta get him one of those T-shirts to remind him. God is good, and all the time. Amen. Truly, it is an honor and a privilege that God has given me to stand once more and again before you to bring the word of God. I'm just praying that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts will be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Have you ever stubbed your toe or bumped that funny bone so tough that you couldn't even cry out? Now, by the way, the funny bone is not a bone at all. It's actually a nerve at the end of your humorous bone. Get it? Humorous? Funny? <laughs> but when you hit it, it's not funny at all. It is not funny at all. The thing is, it hits you so tough, it'll make you stop dead in your tracks for a minute. And the only way that someone will know that something is wrong is your face might be all contorted. You might have tears in your eyes. You're holding your injured body part and you're rocking. The pain is so deep within yourself, you just have to close within yourself for a moment. How about experiencing a hurt, a pain, or a want that is immeasurably greater than a bumped elbow or a stubbed toe? This is when you go into serious prayer. This is when you dig deep down within yourself and go to God in prayer. And the only way that someone may know that something is wrong, your face might be contorted. You might have tears in your eyes. You wrapped your arms around yourself and you're rocking, not saying anything out loud. If you can understand what I'm talking about, then you can relate to our biblical character, Hannah, as we continue our Faith Profile sermon series. Let's hear now some of the story of her life as recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. Hannah. There was a certain man from Ramathiam, a Zuphite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah. Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were the priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Penina, and all of her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. And whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband, Elkanah, said, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you so downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Observed her mouth. And Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. 
Eli answered, go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked for. And Hannah said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went away and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. This morning, we continue our faith profile sermon series with Hannah. Hannah was not a spiritual leader in the true sense of the word. She was not a military warrior in any way. She was a prayer warrior. Hannah teaches us mightily about prayer, about fervent prayer. Fervent. You heard that, kids? Fervent, meaning to show great intensity of spirit with enthusiasm, with passion, wholeheartedly, giving it all you got with sincerity. Now, some people would tell you it doesn't take all that when you're praying. It doesn't, you don't need to do all that hollering. You don't need to use all of your loud voice. You don't need to do all of that. But they don't know what you've been through. They don't know what you may be going through right now. They don't understand what's happening in your life. And maybe they've never known the sweet release or relief of pouring out their heart to God. What was going on with Hannah as she poured out her heart? First off, Hannah's name in the Hebrew means favor or grace, but she was feeling anything but. You see, she was childless and barren. She was being provoked and taunted by her rival, Penina, and most likely she feared for what her future would be without a son. And as much as her husband loved her, he could not do anything about solving her problem to get a child. And the priest thought she was drunk. No, Hannah was not feeling favor or grace. Each of us may face a time of barrenness when nothing comes to birth in our situations, on our jobs, in our relationships, or even within ourselves. These are the times that it is most difficult to pray, but this is exactly the time that you are called to go to God in prayer, to go down on your knees when you're in a dark place, look for light. This is a time when you turn to God in prayer. And Hannah teaches us that very thing about prayer. In her pain, humiliation, and weakness, Hannah digs deep within herself and gives it over to God. In the words of Jacob out of Genesis, it says, I will not let you go until you bless me. Ah, Now, this is a prayer that's deeper than the one you say at mealtime. Lord, thank you for this food. This is deeper than the prayer that you say in the morning, God, I thank you for this day, amen. This is where you wrestle in prayer and cry out to God, I will not let you go until you bless me. Hannah's faith profile teaches us some lessons about prayer, and here are just some of them. The first lesson, Hannah knew where to take her problem, straight to God in prayer. Hannah realized that Penina would taunt her and ridicule her so she couldn't go talk to her sister to sister. Her husband, who loved her very much, had no control over giving her a child she so desperately longed for year after year. And therefore, Hannah went to the one who understood and could do something about it. She was able to take it to God, the one whom she had a relationship with. Do you know him? Do you go to God in prayer? Now, there's a difference between knowing Jesus and knowing about Jesus. There's a difference between knowing about Jesus and having a relationship with him. When you have a relationship with him, you can talk to him as friend to friend. Now, think about how often you talk to your best friend over the phone. Think about how excited you are. Think about how anxious you are to talk over a situation or a situation or a problem, you can go to God as friend to friend. Do you know him or do you just know about him? When you know him, you can turn to him and know that he can step into your situation. Now this recalls something that I heard a preacher share not too long ago. It was some years ago in the mid-1960s, there was a movement called the God is Dead movement, Sister Linda. They said, God is dead. This movement stated that, that, that God is just a myth. That yes, Jesus died on the cross, he went to the grave, but he stayed there. Can you believe that? 
They proclaimed that God was just a social construct designed to just make people feel better. During this time, there was a conference at the University of Chicago. And at this conference one day, they had um, a brown bag lunch meeting where they invited some of the locals to come by so that they could hear these great scholars. After speaking for some time, the, the scholar called for questions, and there in the back of the room was an elderly, white-haired, African-American preacher. He stood up, and he still had an apple in his hand that he was eating, and he stood there, and he says, um, uh, Brother Scholar, uh, you said that a lot of things, I, understand, I don't understand all those Greek and Hebrew words, I don't know all those scholars that you quoted, and I've not read any of those books that you've quoted and talked about. <laughs> you said that God is dead and that Jesus is a myth? And, and, and you called it, you said it was a, just a what? What was that you called it? A social construct? He finished the apple and he throwed it away, and by this time the scholar was getting kind of impatient, like, sir, sir. Do you have a question? He's like, yes. Want to know, was the apple that I just ate, was it sweet or not? The scholar's like, how do I know if it was sweet if I haven't tasted it? The old preacher came back to him and said, well, how can you know my Jesus is sweet if you've never tasted him? And if you've never tasted my Jesus, how can you know that he's real? Amen, somebody. Have you tasted him? Do you know that he is sweet? He's sweet, I know. Do you know him? Do you know that you can pour your heart out to him? Lesson two. In her brokenness and pain, Hannah trusted God's power and ability to work on her behalf. Hannah was oppressed and overcome with grief because she was barren and, and because of the taunts and she was also fearful for her future. She prayed with tears running down her face, but not out loud. Her lips were moving so there was no one could hear her. The priest thought she was drunk, but this action testified, testifies to the belief that God knows our very hearts, our minds, and our desires. And the Holy Spirit intercedes for us through wordless groans, searching our hearts. Hannah could have been angry with God. She could have given Penina a beat down. And don't say I wasn't the only one who thought about that. <laughs> she could have refused comfort from her husband. Instead, she went to God in prayer. What about you? What do you do when you are hurting or in pain? What do you do? Do you stay closed up within yourself? Do you avoid certain people? Do you get angry with God and refuse to even think about, come to church, or even acknowledge God? The root of our ability to trust God lies in what we believe about God's character. Remember, our circumstances may change, but God's character does not. Look at the circumstances through the lens of God's character rather than evaluating God's character through your circumstances and situations. Amen, somebody. The God who stepped into the darkness and chaos of nothingness and created this very universe can step into our barren situation and create something. The love of God can lift us above the lies that bind us to believe that we are not worthy, that no one cares, and we are doomed to stay down. The power of God can pulverize the problems and pain in our life, and this faith in God's power frees us to let go and let God. Somebody say, let go and let God. Amen. The truth of God says, I the truth of God that says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Nothing is impossible with God. God can accomplish abundantly for far more than we can even ask or think. That should blow your mind. It can tear through the turbulence, the turmoil, and the tears in your life. Therefore, like Hannah, you can trust God's power and ability to work on your behalf. 
You can trust God's power and ability to handle your brokenness and your pain. Lesson three, the truth of God helped Hannah to believe God would do what he said he would do. And so after Hannah prayed, she had peace. When we give something to God, it feels wonderful because we are essentially giving up that burden, worries, and cares over to him who can handle the problem and us. We are doing what Philippians 4, 6 instructs for us to do, which is not to be anxious about anything, but in everything. Somebody say everything. Everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Present your request unto God. And when you do this, we can have an overwhelming peace knowing that God, it is in God's hands, which is what Philippians 4 and 7 explains will happen. It says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Early in our scripture, Hannah was distraught and would not eat. By the end of the reading in verse 18, Hannah went her way and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. What happened? What was the difference between that and verse 18? Well, you see, Hannah's prayer was not instantly answered, but she knew in her heart that God was at work on her behalf. And though nothing had changed in her outward appearance, God know, uh, Hannah knew that God had heard her, and that makes all the difference in the world. This is a beautiful example of the composing influence of prayer. Hannah had cast her cares on the Lord, and so her own spirit was relieved of the load. The reason that Hannah could feel this was because prayer brings us closer to God. And the more we pray, the closer we get. The closer we get, the more peace we receive. The more peace we receive, the closer we want to stay with God. And the closer we stay with God, the better we can hear God speak to us. We believe, as it says in Colossians 1 and 17, God is before us, all things in him hold together. Then we can trust God and know that he's got everything. Somebody say everything. everything. But pastor, what about? No, everything. But, everything. but pastor, what about? No, everything under control. God's peace is different from the world's peace. True peace does not come from positive thinking, absence of conflict, or feeling good. It comes from knowing that God is in control. Let go and what? Let go and God. The best way we can do that is to be still and know. Stand firm. The Lord will fight for you. And my favorite is, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. And when you do, you too, like Hannah, can trust, believe, and have peace that God will do what God said he would do. God loves and cares about everything in our life, even stubbed toes and bumped elbows. But because life can carry much greater hurt and pain, we know that we have an avenue to God. And Hannah shared it with us. We can take our problems straight to God in prayer. We can trust that God will do what God said he would do. We can trust in God's power and his ability. The persistent, fervent prayer warrior Hannah was blessed even beyond these things. You see, Hannah becomes the mother of the great prophet Samuel, who ruled, who leads Israel for nearly eight decades. While Penina's children, what do we know about them? Nothing. We don't know their name, and we don't know what they did or what became of them. Hannah relied on the power of prayer to get her through. But having a little talk with Jesus. The old song that we're about to sing says, have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your trouble. He will hear your faintest cry, and he'll answer by and by. When you feel that prayer will turn it, you know that the fire is burning. Know that having a little talk with Jesus will make it right. 
Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you stand and join us in singing just a little talk with Jesus? So here's what I know about that song. If you're a former Baptist, it leads you to dancing, doesn't it, Debbie? See? Get you in big trouble. Get you in big trouble. And those of you who didn't grow up in the Baptist church were kind of standing like this going, what's going on? Well, that's an awesome song. You need to learn that one. That's really awesome. As we go out today, go out in the strength of the Lord. Don't neglect the opportunity to have a little talk with Jesus. Don't neglect bringing fervor to your prayer, don't do that. And remember to, to share your heart's desires with Jesus, because Jesus really cares for you. Lord, as we go from this place today, help us to know that you're already out there ahead of us. You go with us, you surround us, you undergird us. Lord, if we need to ask for your power in our lives, we need to trust you enough. We need to trust you enough to give you our burdens, we also need to know you enough to trust you with our heart's desires. And so, Lord, help us to go out there and love the world that you love. In your name, amen.